This is the inaugural episode of A Round of Gwent With. And first, let me explain a little more on what to expect from these discussions. While it's easier to call them interviews, they are more of a chat as I don't want it to be a simple question and answer. I send out a questionnaire the guests are free to respond to. Right now, it's probably about 50-50. But I assure you that almost nothing brought up comes back to these questions. I don't tell the guests what I'm going to ask them about because, honestly, most of my questions are based on their immediate responses. I hope this spontaneity really shows and you get to feel this is an open and honest talk about anything and everything. And so far in five completed episodes, none of them are alike. But thank you, the listener, for taking time to check this out. And all ratings, reviews, likes, subscribes, shares, and all that are much appreciated. Today's guest is Tia Beastie, who was absolutely fantastic. And it was a wonderful chat that I couldn't be more proud of. Everywhere you can find her is in the show notes below. She has a Twitch in which she recently became a partner, a budding YouTube channel where you can find Gwent Strategy, among other things, a Sneak Energy sponsorship, and who knows what is to come as she is clearly on her way up, and I cannot be more grateful for her participation in this. Enjoy. All right, welcome. I am here. With the first guest, this is probably going to be the first episode is, you know, we kind of get things going. With Tia Beastie, how are you today? I'm fine. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited for this new project of yours. Yeah, so am I. So first things first, take me through or take us through what a typical day for you is on the most normal of normal days. Hmm. All right. Well, I believe Corona has now become the norm. Uh, let's assume this was just my gap year as I did plan. I wake up in the morning. If I can do that before 11, I'm very happy. I normally go to bed at 2 a.m. So if I get eight hours of sleep, it's all good. You're on then, that, uh, <laughs> that 20 year old or 20 schedule right there. I remember that. Pretty much, pretty much. Hey, I know some people who have it worse. So, <laughs> um, before afternoon is good. We, we then go for a shower. We make French toast normally after that. It's, it's the must-have breakfast with some protein, some carbs to keep me going. Then uh, we spend most of the day attempting to be creative and doing that productively. So I'll either write outside, um, working on the book I'm attempting to write, or I will study. And then at night, we normally do a stream if we're, we're feeling up for it. Okay. That's pretty much my day. So you hit on something that I definitely want to talk about, and that's writing, because that's something we, we both have in common there. So what are you yeah. writing? What are you working on? Oh, right. right now we're working on the book I have been writing since high school. The problem is I've always had the story I wanted to write. I just never had the skills developed yet to finish the book. So I had to ta- teach myself how to write in high school. That's slowly developed. Now, every year I basically reread what I have so far and then I see things I haven't seen before because I am now um, more skilled than I were. Uh, So basically, we are trying to finish this book before the end of the year and we are going to get it published next year. It's almost done. We are now editing it. The story is already already written down. Okay, what's it about? What's it about? Well, it is about, it's a young adult science fiction. It's basically, have you read Lord of the Flies? I did. That was required reading back in high school <laughs> and we watched the movie of it. And, but oh I, dear. The, yeah, what I, re- yeah, yeah, I, I remember Sensitive that. Censored one? <laughs> yeah, I believe what, there's a very violent one and one that is less violent or maybe that's in book form, I can't recall. Yeah. So I, it's very violent. I don't, yeah, I think there's only one I remember. And what I remember out of it is Piggy and the rock <laughs> dropping on his head. And it was just a really, that's a, man, that is an interesting story. There is so much to take out of that. I know. It it will, I think there's a lot of ways in which you can interpret it. You can go in psychologically about the ego and the way the super ego controls it, et cetera. Or you can just go into society itself and it's commenting on the the primal instinct that's a, is always right at the surface wanting to break free, especially in children. So I quite like that idea. Not that I took it, I just see similarities in the work I'm doing. So in my book, it's about the theory that aliens exist and that they are abducting people. But mine goes into that small minority of people who never return. 
where would they take you if they abducted you? So in this story, children all across the world start to disappear. Nobody knows how, but our main character gets abducted and he wakes up on this alien planet, which is very much like prehistoric Earth. And he comes across all these children from toddlers to teenagers who have been dropped there and left to survive. And they don't know why and they don't know how they're going to get back. But they all have one thing in um, one thing. Uh, where is my English now? <laughs> one thing uh, similar to each other. And that is that they have a mark on their arm and the mark represents something they don't know what yet. Anyway, so it's called Children of the Mark. And our main character, John, has to somehow lead this camp and try to get the children to work together to come to a solution. Yeah, it's very, it's very uh, realistic in the sense that a lot of children die and it happens in a very um, gory way, in the same way that Lord of the Flies showed it to the viewer. I want to replicate that, but in a different form, with a different metaphor, of course, which I can't spoil for you yet. Oh, of course not. But Lord of the, <laughs> yeah. Fri- uh, Lord of the Flies, <laughs> Lord of the Flies, yeah, <laughs> reading that in high school was, that was almost something that at least I couldn't really handle. Like I get why they did it for children because it was children, but I remember Mm. just reading it and thinking, or not getting out of it what I was supposed to. I think every, and again, maybe this was like an American boy kind of thing, was just like, oh, I would do this, I would do this, or I'd fight back, or I'd kind of do all that, which again is absolute nonsense. If I was thrown on a deserted island with anybody (laughs) when I was in high school, I would have died probably immediately, or I might have, you know, Pretty much. Someone else might have died <laughs> in that sense. So no, that sounds that sounds really interesting. Take me through your writing process. How do you go about it? Hmm. Well, see, that is one of the things that took me the longest to develop because in high school, at least here in South Africa, the curriculum teaches you how to write short stories and essays. So the one thing that is extremely lacking is character development. You never get to build a character in a short story because it's a very linear sort of 400 word story and that doesn't happen. Now we have to throw into the story so many characters and uh, that's what I'm trying to do now. The story has been written, but the characters need to represent certain parts of society. And I need to show how the interaction of these different uh, spheres, you know, bring certain results. So for example, um, we have this one group of children on the planet who are called the feral, and they're almost a myth, but it's the children who are very much outcasts. They don't want to conform to what is happening on the planet. So they just strip off their clothes. They um, camouflage themselves in mud and they stop speaking languages altogether because you're from all over the world. So nobody understands each other. It's supposed to represent like the chaos of people who don't want to conform. But yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's getting the characters, the essence of humanity into the book, which is the most difficult part because the story can be all out and it can be crazy. But if the characters don't represent humanity, it's not realistic, even though it's science fiction. It's, that's, that's why I'm studying psychology, believe it or not. It's to get my books to be more realistic. Law is just to protect myself in this country I am living in, South Africa. But uh, 100%. But yeah, psychology is all about understanding humanity and the way people think. It's extremely interesting. Yeah, psychology. So my degree is in history. And at least in the United States, you generally have a major and you generally have a minor. Or you can have like a double major or something like that. So my degree was history. And my minor was humanities and humanities is basically the liberal arts of liberal arts. So, you know, like liberal arts, you have this umbrella of your history, all your social, you know, sciences and stuff like that. And then even like teaching, because I'm a high school teacher, again, I've taught world history, world geography, economics, sociology, and U.S. history, but I've never taught psychology. And I only took one psych class in college and it, it was at a, it was at a junior college and I didn't really get too much into it there. But Mm. what brought you to like psychology? Why did you pick psychology? Well, at first I studied philosophy and psychology, but philosophy, I don't know, it was very frustrating for me because it didn't teach you how to think for yourself, at least the, the junior class I took. It taught you how other people before you thought and why it's worthwhile uh, going into that. 
And I didn't quite like that because it didn't give you the opportunity to um, yeah, think for yourself. Whereas psychology, there are still so many things that are unsolved. It's, it's not just philosophizing about things. It's about the way the human mind works and the way people work. And I always, yeah, free will is something you mentioned before this interview. How much free will do we truly have? How much of it is... Um, already predetermined by your environment or by the way that your DNA and genes are put together and your interaction with your family. Um, yeah, how much of it is within your control? And it's only when we understand that when we can start to manipulate what we can't control um, or what other people can't control, if you will. Okay, so a massive thing in psychology is nature versus nurture, right? Yeah. Okay, and that plays into your free will and all of that. So what in your opinion and your analysis, and especially if you have a degree in it would be an expert opinion, what are, is there free will or to you, what is there? Yeah. Hmm. Well, let's see if you, there would definitely be two schools of thought. One would be scientifically and the other one would be uh, spiritually. And those two often don't go hand in hand. Some would say they're mutually exclusive. Uh, what, What answer would you like to hear? whatever you got. <laughs> mm. Also, I'll lead off with this and I'll say it, maybe it can kind of help you get in there. To me, yeah. it's almost, and free will is also, it's more of like philosophy to at least mm. kind of where I, I would be coming from. And it's always, I used to be religious, like very religious. And I look mm. at my Sundays now and my Sundays used to be when I was in college, I worked the soundboard at my church and I'd go to all three services in the morning. And then I'd go to two Bible studies in the evening. And when I was even younger, church was boring to me. And so instead of listening to that, I would like read the Bible. And so coming from that, it was always like, well, you know, because there's a God and because, because he's omniscient and omnipotent and all of that, I can mm-hmm. choose to do certain things, but that's always what was going to happen. Whether or not I take a right at destiny. this road or, or I take a left. And it's like a destiny thing. But now yeah. that I don't really believe in anything, you know, of a higher level that's like guiding us. Mm. It's still like, oh, I can do what I want. I can right now, you know, in this interview, I can turn off my computer. I can say whatever I can do that. But in a way, that's kind of what was always going to happen. Right. So I'm Mm. kind of speaking in circles here, but it's almost where, yeah, we do have free will to do it. But at the same time, what don't we control? It's almost like predetermined that you will have free will and come to this uh, destination. But you still have free will. It's like, it's, it's, it's a very much of a loop, like a retrospective loop. It's yeah. Time, time is very weird. It's, it's, but I get how you're explaining it. So even though you do not believe in a higher intelligence, you still believe that there's more to it, that there is some sort of path already planned for you, even though you might have free will. Is that what you're trying to say or am I understanding it wrong? No, I'm, I'm of the, and again, this is what back to the religion. And then when I got into philosophy and then the cosmos and all of that, no, I, if I had to say right now, I would say that it's, it's chaos that no, Mm. maybe not. If, if we are here by accident, that doesn't mean what we do does not matter. Um, Mm. And I'm not like a nihilist, but to me, it's almost, if you get like meaning of life and all that, it's intrinsic. It's mm. what you make of it. And some people can make of that to be really good and to be altruistic or as altruistic as possible, or yeah. they can do, you know, be hedonistic and to say, no, the meaning of life is just to have as much pleasure and everyone else be damned. And so mm. to me, like there may be something out there. I don't know that. Like, I'm not saying, oh, there is absolutely nothing out there. My yeah, thing is ag- agnostic. It, yeah, it would be agnostic in the sense of, yeah, we just don't know in that sense. Yeah. But to me, there is nothing guiding us. Like there's no, to me, no religions out there. Um, mm. Like I ascribe to any of them. They don't kind of have the answers to me. That was always something back in the day that used to explain it. We have more stuff that explain it now. And yeah. to me, it's almost if we're worrying about the next life, then we're not caring as much about this one. And I think there's a lot of stuff (laughs) that should be taken care of here first. But to hit back on the destiny aspect, it's more or less, I don't know, it's kind of confusing in the sense of what is going to happen is going to happen. I might Hmm. go through an intersection, get slammed by a car. I might not. It's random. I guess that's kind of the best way to say it. Very interesting. I can see where you're coming from. It's very interesting uh, how many people were 
very uh, big religious people, uh, representatives who normally turn out to not believe later on. It's, you find that the biggest atheists have the most knowledge when it comes to many religions across the world. They've done their research, then came to the conclusion. It's, it's quite interesting. Then you have people who take the next step and go back, or you have people who just never make the step of atheism and they're, they don't want to make, ask any questions because they're afraid that their whole religion will shatter to pieces. It's, it's very interesting. I had this um, teacher in high school who's the biggest Christian I've ever met. And I had all these questions and I kept asking them. And one day, one of the biggest questions that bothers me, because it's the whole uh, thing about Christianity, I won't go too much into it, is because you believe in this person named Christ who came down and he's the proof, the owners of proof that your religion exists, right? And um, what if aliens exist, <laughs> right? Uh, what if aliens exist and they have advanced technology and they can easily come down to earth pretending to be a man and they can do miracles which we wouldn't understand then because of technology that is far beyond our comprehension right so i just asked him do you think aliens could exist and he's like no no way aliens can't possibly exist they just don't i'm like but you can't say that there's a possibility right and he's like no he doesn't believe they exist and i realized then it's because he doesn't want to um, acknowledge the fact that if any other intelligent life exists it brings into question our beliefs. It brings into question the onus of proof, which is that we are special and we are here alone and we have a, a God protecting us. It's, I don't know, it, it's one of my most um, interesting uh, talking points. I can go into it for hours and hours. And yeah, because I personally do believe that uh, there should be intelligent life out there in the form of whatever extraterrestrials, organisms that are once celled and on the Mars, <laughs> but we know, but we certainly aren't alone. And I think we need to take that into account with our belief systems. Yeah, that was a, yeah. that was a big thing that broke my brain. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, one thing that I did was I graduated college and then went and taught and coached high school and then decided I want to go back and coach college. Well, to do that, I had to be a graduate student because I was going to be a graduate assistant. So I had to go back to school. So I got in graduate school for history but in that time just being back on a college campus i got into other interests and one thing was like very basic like physics almost in the philosophy angle of physics and the, like i said previously the cosmos and all that and it was trying to wrap my head around this tiny earth that we live in in this tiny solar system that yeah. makes up trillions of them in this unfathomable unfathomable there you go it's tough to say there universe and mm -hmm. at that point it hit me to where there's yeah there's just no way that we would be the only even carbon-based life form out there exactly and yeah. then like you said there in i don't know i'm sure there's ways that can be somewhat justified but if it is because we are special according to the bible and all that we are special we were created in god's image in all mm -hmm. this sense there and if there is an alien life form out there that doesn't look like us, it kind of takes yeah. that all away. And then it goes back to where, okay, well, if God did create us in the sense, what is the reason for all of this other earth? And the main thing mm. that I asked people, and it was this question that when I asked myself, it couldn't be answered. And this is mainly from the Christian aspect. Mm. And as far as like European exploration, they did not arrive in the new world Americas, you know, 1492 and all that. And so I would ask anybody who believes in it, what was the meaning of life? Why are we here? And it's always well it's to preach the gospel of Christ and spread it and serve and all that. And yeah, so I yeah. always asked, what about mm. the Aztec Indian who was born in what we know as 1411 and Before they lived their whole, their whole life and they died in 1463. They were yeah. never given the opportunity to accept or reject Christ. We know yeah. they existed. So what was the point of them? And that question has never been adequately answered to me. And at mm. that point, I realized this just isn't for me. It's the problem with religion, right? It's, it's why I always feel like I'm betraying Christianity. If I want to say I'm not really religious, but spiritual, I know that sounds very cliche. It's, it's more like, let's say there is a God or whatever you'd like to call him, a, a universe that somehow is aware of itself, whatever it's, if the religious aspect of it was somehow um, written down by humans and 
it says one thing, but it, it preaches another and et cetera, et cetera. If there's problems with the religion, it doesn't make that being less, um, what do you call it? Make him less plausible, his existence. It's, I don't know. I feel like religion is very flawed because humans are flawed. I feel like if there is a truth, religion isn't going to give us the answer in, in a way that we want to comprehend it at least. I am, um, for example, I don't think if there is some sort of afterlife that the only way you can go there is by believing in a religion. That just doesn't make sense. And if a God is just and fair, that doesn't make sense. And I mean, of course, you can't say everyone before this point is doomed to, to not exist anymore or go to hell, or whatever your religion says will happen to them. Or um, my favorite one is people who live on an island all their lives. I've also asked many Christians, um, what do you think happened to them? And they say, oh, well, they go to hell. <laughs> or, or the people who have a little bit of a conscience, they're like, oh, no, um, someone will find their way to that island one day and show them the truth. I'm like, okay, but what if they don't? <laughs> they can't give me an answer because, of course, you can't say they're going to hell. Even I don't believe if there is an afterlife, you have to believe in a God. I think the purpose of life would also not be to preach God's greatness or whatever. I think there would be a very definite purpose. And I myself believe the purpose of life is, well, evolving spiritually. And that normally happens through suffering. I don't think life on earth is supposed to be that great. And I don't think we're supposed to have the answers because like you say, if we knew exactly what to do to get to the next life or whatever, people would just start killing themselves in millions. There, there's even been movies about it, which were quite nice. It's people won't people will start to find loopholes and they won't do what they're supposed to do and you know it's like people who think they go to church therefore they're saved meanwhile they're horrible people i've met so many of them and they think they found the loophole which is just believing and it's not that simple because even the bible you have so many contradictions where in one chapter it says well if you merely believe in christ you go to heaven and in another, they say, well, on the day of judgment, you'll have people before me saying, well, we believed in you and we went to church every Sunday and we prayed. And then God will say, well, I don't know you because uh, you, like a tree, you, you bear fruit that represents who you are. And if your fruit are rotten, so are you and et cetera, et cetera, right? There are so many contradictions showing that merely believing in a God isn't enough. And I think not believing in him at all won't get you to when make you go to hell if i don't think there is a hell by the way i think if there is, it even is an afterlife the opposite would be merely not existing after death exactly what atheists believe is you simply die but of course you have to believe in a soul right it's like i said i can go into this um very much but yeah, it's because i think hell yeah. hell and this was what i was always even when i read it all and got into it like yeah. i don't think there's a proper hell like that we think of in Christianity for Judaism, like in the Old Testament. I don't think there is one. Yeah. I don't think there is. And again, maybe someone who's more well-versed in that can kind of say it. And then, yeah, mm -hmm. stuff like the devil and hell and all that. When we think of that, when I say we, I should generally say maybe Western, you know, mm -hmm. visions or impressions of Christianity. It goes back to yeah. Dante's Inferno. Like Dante's oh, yeah. Inferno is basically like what had, or like not what created hell. Hell was obviously in there but hmm. of where we get this idea from it. And to me, that was always something too, that was very eye opening because it was the same where, like you said, a lot of people that become atheists, and I'm not saying this to be snarky and I don't mean for oh, us yeah. you know, really to really down talk or talk bad about religion or anybody who believes in that. But hmm. to me, like when someone says, Oh, how did you become an atheist? And my thing is like, I read the Bible. Like that, <laughs> exactly. that's what made me, like you said, initially I yeah. dove into the Bible being like, I want to know everything about this. So when hmm. people ask me, I can, defend my positions and I can, oh, maybe help people with that. But again, the mm. more I got into it, the more that it was just like, this doesn't make sense. And especially when you look at mm -hmm. like the essence, like the Bible itself, the books in the Bible, you know, the, what we know of it now, the New Testament was not put together for hundreds of years yeah. after Christ. And they weren't written down until much later than what it was. It wasn't like someone was following and chronicle along what was happening. Yeah, and to exactly. me, it was, when they took, oh, this book? No, we don't want that book out. Okay, we want that book. Oh, no, we don't want that. Oh, we want that. Yeah, they nitpicked. It's problematic. Yeah. 
it was handpicked so and books. manipulative. Exactly. That were never added, which is to me, is just so troubling. Um, I believe so many are stored in the Vatican right now. Not a conspiracy theory, real books that were just never added to the Bible. It wasn't deemed fit. And that's why I say religion is so problematic. It's just like, you can't just pick what you like and put it together. I think even if there is truth, and I believe there is, it's not in that book. It's Some of it could be. And um, I think, yeah, people need to find their own truth. But at the end of the day, I don't think the story you believe in is going to get you to a potential afterlife. I think it would come down to your core being and the way you lived your life. So you I hit on... Think, yeah. Oh, so you hit on one thing that I definitely want to uh, ask you about. You basically seem mm. to say that, not in these words so much, yeah. but to exist is to suffer. Like kind of mm. life is kind of suffering. That's incredibly Buddhist. So is uh, that something? Is it? Oh, yes. Like that's pretty much what like Buddha was, was he sold, um, sold everything he had and went and was like, we're not supposed to almost experience joy in anything. And like, that oh, was the gosh. whole point of to reach that enlightenment was you have to get rid of your mm. material possessions and kind mm. of understand all that. But again, I may be getting that a little bit confused, but I'm pretty sure like that's yeah. kind of the essence of Buddhism. Well, I wouldn't, well, I like Buddhism for certain reasons, but I haven't actually studied it. So what you just said is new to me. I do, when I picture Buddhism, I picture the monk all day meditating, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, so far, if I had to pick my own sort of belief system, I wouldn't call it religion because like they say, Buddhism isn't exactly believing in a God. It's a way of life. Literally, it's, you can be a Christian and a Buddhist, which is very Yeah, Buddhism is more a philosophy than religion for sure. I like that very much. Yeah, the only, mm, I don't know. I have this, there are some flaws in the, the way Buddhism um, is constructed. I think they do want you to, how can I say they want you to exit the karmic justice system, which is earth. They want you to live a life pure of, you know, free of sin, free of any material possessions, like you said. So you might move on and you don't have to be reincarnated. That's what they believe, at least. I think doing that is counterintuitive to what my belief is, which is that life is suffering. And I think that might be a sort of purpose. If, if we were created by a being, I think we are supposed to interact with the world. We are, we shouldn't hide ourselves from potential suffering just so we can move on. I think we should help others while we are here. I think, um, I think it would be selfish of me to just sit in my room all day and meditate, if you get what I'm saying. Though I do like Buddhism very much. I, I think there is a tiny bit more to life than just focusing on the next life, like you said, and trying to move on. I think we do need to interact with the world and do a part, at least help others. Well, and that, that in part is what drives me crazy about, and again, it seems like we're really picking on Christianity, <laughs> Christian, <laughs> but that's what drives me crazy is, and again, this is also probably more an American thing. Like there is an American mm -hmm. evangelical Christianity that is unique in the fact that it's really more about American exceptionalism than it really is about religion. It's just something to grasp, mm -hmm. grasp a hold of and to kind of wield that, you know, as a cudgel against others. But to me, that's what it was. And it's Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, the, one of the early presidents, had a thing called the Jeffersonian Bible. Have you heard of it? I haven't. Okay, so he had a thing called, it's Jeffersonian or Jefferson Bible, where he essentially took out all of these supernatural aspects of Christ and left mm. in like the teachings. And if you just leave in the teachings of Christ, it's very mm. almost Buddhist because yeah. you know, there's one parable where someone's like, hey, how do I enter? The kingdom of god and he's like sell everything and follow me the guy's like Oof, never mind <laughs> i yeah. don't want to do that but that's essentially what it was you know jesus was a carpenter or you know a carpenter sold everything didn't really have anything went about preaching saying hey do all this wash mm -hmm. lepers feet you know hung out with all the undesirables and yeah. basically the essence of christianity is beside you know believe in christ and do all that and spread the word it's basically help other people be kind to other people, be mm. uh, empathetic and compassionate. And to me, that's something that I've like stayed with. And it's been in that sense yeah. where it's like, okay, you know, there's still good teachings. And that to me is where I'm not saying anybody who's Christian is bad or dumb in that sense. It's yeah. just basically the Christians that I have respect for are the ones who the first thing out of their mouth is always how they can help. And it's not, mm. oh, this is wrong. And 
you know, do mm-hmm. all this. It basically what it's been tied to politics in this country. Yeah. And to me, that's something where the teachings of it is great because I'm, I'm with you in that same way. I mm-hmm. have a lot of guilt and a lot of, you know, a term, a lot of it is like, you know, it's like a white guilt in that sense when you're dealing with like the racial aspects of the country. But to mm-hmm. me, it's also everything, even like a class, like I'm not wealthy at all. I was born to two parents who grew up very poor, you know, worked their ass off, got very lucky and, Mm -hmm. you know, got to that straight middle-class suburbs, American dream. And so I've had every single thing I could possibly need and want and through nothing of my own. I was literally Mm -hmm. lucky enough to have been born to two people who had their shit together. And, you know, especially working in schools, in these high schools, in these inner city schools, and just Mm -hmm. seeing so many of these kids that, they were just dealt a horrible hand and yeah. you know, they're behind the eight ball. Everything's going to be an uphill battle because of their class, because of the race, because of just the way they were raised. And this goes for even beyond mm. uh, race. It's harder, obviously for non-white people in this country, but even if you're white, poor, born to, you know, people who've had drug issues or addiction, you know, mm. you're not raised in that same way that I was. And to me, it's almost immoral not to give back and not to help out. And again, by I'm not, again, I'm not even a billionaire or anything like that. But to Mm. me, if I I can kick, you know, a couple hundred bucks here and there or 50 bucks here and there, that's the bare minimum that I think that should be done. Yeah. No, I 100% agree with you. 100%. Mm. The problem is uh, also people, people want to, a lot of people will tell you the purpose of life is to be happy. So cliche. And it's because of that reasoning why so many people are depressed because they think they aren't fulfilling uh, that prophecy. They think they're not reaching their purpose because they're unhappy. And uh, it's, it's not supposed to be like that. And even in religion, we're not, people say, well, if, if God can uh, control everything, then why is this suffering? But you think the purpose of life is to have a good life. Perhaps everyone has been dealt a, a certain hand because they need to, you know, go through certain things in this life. And because only through suffering do we truly grow. And we are promised a better life free of suffering after this one, which definitely indicates that if earth was perfect, it would be called heaven, but it isn't. And uh, yeah, I think truly it's through suffering do we grow. And perhaps some of us are about other hands to test us, to test us in different ways. Like what do you do with your newfound uh, you know, riches, do you give back? Do you hoard it all for yourself? I mean, that's truly when your character is tested, right? When you have opportunity to do something, but you don't. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I would call myself agnostic, by the way, because I also don't have the answers, but I think there are many, many theories that are very plausible for why things are as they are. But yeah, there's a lot of suffering on earth. It's very sad. And that's why I don't think, I don't think, uh, one can be truly happy in this life if you have any sort of empathy or know what's going on. There will always be suffering. And yeah, so I do believe that is some sort of purpose here. Yeah, that was At least the... Viktor Frankl says that's one of the purposes of life, right? Only through suffering can we truly find our purpose. Yeah, that and that's, in itself. that's kind of speaking, even to take it on a much less serious thing, like the coaching yeah. and the athlete in me is like, you mm. have to struggle and do all that. And yesterday, was the first time and this is, God, this is we're talking at such a high level i'm gonna bring it down to just something so dumb that's fine <laughs> but yesterday was the first day i'd worked out like legs and did like a bunch of sprints in that and so my entire my hamstrings and my glutes are just dead but it's like you said there it's <laughs> yeah. that i want that because that means that's getting better and yeah. that's just the physical thing and something that doesn't really matter And to Mm. me, like it is, it's that struggling and like, I just, I don't know that feeling. And I've been so damn Mm. lucky. I don't know what it's like to go to a grocery store and be like, oh, I have to put this back or I can't do it. And like you said there, I just get depressed thinking that, you know, that exists. And then it depresses me even more. Mm. Not that, because people be like, oh, you can't cure all that. You can't do all that. I'm like, well, we don't know who's never really tried. And that's what depressed me the most is when... Mm. Like it's the uncaring, it's the apathy. To me, that is the worst thing in the world. It's not mm-hmm. even, I mean, don't, okay, hate is worse when you do stuff physically, you know, and that it is worse. But to me, yeah, like apathy is just like not, it's not caring. And it's I just inhuman. don't understand. Yeah, I just don't understand with what happens in the world, like how people can be 
uncaring about it? Like, how do you not give mm -hmm. any opinion on it or just not see it? And I don't know, like, again, that just depresses me even more. <laughs> I, I understand what you're saying. There are too many people like that. And some, you want to think some are maybe born like that and they're less human because of it, maybe even evil in a sense. And others were maybe very empathetic at some point in their lives, so much so that I had to switch it off entirely just to cope. And uh, that's even more depressing, right? Because if you feel for everyone all the time, all at once, and that can bring you into depression, even maybe at some point, you just switch it all off and stop caring about anything. I think uh, you become nihilistic. I think people who are more intelligent uh, do that at some point in their lives. Many do. It's not a good thing. Like I said, you have to carry, you have, like Jordan Peterson says, you have to pick your burden and carry it. And yeah, it's having empathy is very uh, necessary i think okay yeah. so we've okay so we've gotten deep level conversation <laughs> we've done this so i want to bring it to something that i know you're very into and that is harry potter right oh yes very okay much so. so should i read i've seen all the movies should i read the books hmm is it worth what, it do you think what types of books do you normally read uh, generally, as far as fiction goes, uh, obviously the Witcher books. Um, I've read oh, yeah. like I've read like Game of Thrones. That's pretty much a, like recently in that vein of what it would be. Like uh, one of my favorite books, The Confederacy of Dunces, is something a little bit in there. But I generally read mm. nonfiction, generally like historical based nonfiction. And so okay. basically, because my fiance is super into it, she's read all the books numerous times. And yeah. so she's always tried to get me to read it, but I just, keeper. I don't know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's awesome. And you just bought your new house, I believe. Yes, we did. And as, as you can see, actually, I think I, the box is kind of hidden back over there and you see the sword, one of them fell I can off. See the sword. Yeah. One is on there. <laughs> one fell off and the other one I took off. So it didn't fall off and I haven't got around to doing it it's because it, there's just so much. There's so much to do and I don't know. I, I highly recommend it, but then I don't because it just becomes something mm. always needs to be done. I understand. Oh, well, I'm sure, I'm sure you'll have a great journey. And hey, if you love your house, then I'm very glad you purchased it. I, we need a house tour at some time. Uh, yeah, well, and that's, we've kind of still, we still need to get these like sectional couch and then a couple of other things we're waiting on. And then I've almost got, the workout room done and then the outdoor one. And so it's kind of where, mm. I don't know, it, it was so much to do that we've kind of both stopped kind of doing it a little bit. <laughs> and we're just like, we'll do it when we want to. Cause it was one of those Bye. where I just got tired of it. And again, it, it was just too much. Yeah. Uh, it wants to do. Taking a breather. It's more than necessary. I think you guys deserve it. But um, Harry Potter, the, uh, J.K. Rowling did one thing really greatly, and she wrote it in such a way that you can read it from a very young age. It's If you still have that childlike nature inside of you, you'll, you'll love the books. You definitely will love the books if you love the movies. But yeah, it's, it's very simply written. It's, you can understand it from a very young age. How different are the books from the movies? Because like with, with Game of Thrones, once you get into like the second or third season, I mean, they are just drastically different for obvious reasons. Like, you know, I have to cut out three fourths mm. of the characters, but how different is it? Well, I mean, the movies always bring you the action, right? It, it wants you to constantly stay uh, watching. You have, your eyes need to be glued to the screen. Whereas the books are going more into depth about magic and the school and Harry's development, his friends. It's very interesting because you get to read more of what goes on inside the classes and the exams, et cetera, which I quite like because if you like world building, you need that. Um, okay. So yeah. yeah, I want, I want to get, cause that's what I love the most about Harry Potter. And I can't wait for that. The still unannounced game that's supposed to come out. Oh, yes. The I RPG. can't wait because yeah, I've always loved the mm. idea, even though I'd never want to go to one, I've always loved the idea of boarding schools. And uh, in the United States, boarding schools are a very New England, Northeastern thing where it's usually very mm. wealthy, but I've yeah. always liked the idea of kind of an Lord of the Flies-esque thing on their own. You're throwing all these kids together and they're yeah. not with their parents. And what mm. drives me crazy about Harry Potter, and this goes back to like that predestination, 
is the yeah. idea of like Slytherin house. And I'm not one, everyone said this uh, before, but it's mm. basically like, are they, are they all bad because they're in Slytherin house or is it just, oh no, all the bad kids go there. Like are some kids okay, but then like, <laughs> oh, you're going to Slytherin house and you're going to be with, you know, the Nazi wizards and all these people. And <laughs> yeah. does that make them bad? So how does that work exactly? See, that's one of the things the movie will show you, right? It only shows you the really bad Slytherin characters. Meanwhile, Slytherin is more based on a house that seeks power. It's, it's not necessarily evil, but you'll find that most of the evil people tend to seek power, obviously. Are there so, good characters from the books in Slytherin House? Yeah, I do recall that being the case. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think of main characters. You mostly experience Malfoy, etc., etc., and you get to learn Harry Potter's friends. Um, I can't recall <laughs> now that I think about it. I recall the houses because they go into detail about what each house means, which is very interesting. Um, yeah, no, I don't think we actually get to learn about the people in Slytherin. I've read the books a very, very, very long time ago. And only the first half, by the way. <laughs> I stopped there because it I was already too old because I didn't read it as a child. So when I say it's very childlike, it's like I quickly... Um, I don't know. I, I grew tired of the story at some point because I've watched the movies at least a dozen times each, maybe a lot more than that. But um, yeah, in the beginning of the book, you mostly experience Harry and his friend group, and that's pretty much it, and Malfoy and his. So um, yeah, but like I said, Slytherin isn't supposed to be evil, but it does bring out the strongest of wizards who seek power like Voldemort does, and they tend to be in Slytherin. But yeah, think, it's a, a correlation, not a causation, if you get so, what I'm saying. Yeah, and I, that's probably also, and that's the problem with the movies. And considering yeah. they started 19 years ago, I'm, mm. I'm hoping, although yeah. with J.K. Rowling's recent, you know, in the news, <laughs> oh, it, yeah. might put, it might be a little bit less now. But I was always hoping that when, because, you know, everyone's like, oh, reboot, reboot. They always want to reboot. But to me, that's something mm. that needs to be a series make that a series, give it a high production value. And then like Game of Thrones, each book being eight to 10 episodes mm. to really dive into it because, oh. and that, so that's you think what they should do that with Harry oh, Potter. 100% because I think they could mm. just get more into it because I think of, I haven't read the books, like I said, I don't know, but I think like with yeah. Game of Thrones, if they tried to make that into movies, they would have been absolutely dreadful because there wasn't enough time to explore mm. and like i said to me the best no. thing or the most interesting thing to me about harry potter is hogwarts and to yeah. me to explore and that's why as far as the movies go i prefer the first three because they're in hogwarts like almost entirely yeah. same same okay so what's your favorite movie of them woof all right it would have to be number three the, the fourth movie somehow makes me think about the game which I played on PlayStation. <laughs> and <Quidditch. laughs> I, I could never finish that game because in the end you have to duel Voldemort and that scared me as a child so much I, I never got past that point. So somehow now the movie is spoiled too. I don't know why, but I like number three. Having, um, having uh, what's the hippogriff and having uh, the time Buckbeak. traveling aspect. Yes, Buckbeak, exactly. And having to save Sirius um quite like that one i like you're, you're right i can't even recall the latest movies too much because i haven't rewatched them so many times i rewatched the first the second the third and the fourth one over and over again like i can word every single sentence in that movie off to off by heart almost but um yeah it's because of the school aspect which we all like it's once he gets out it starts changing the whole narrative um yeah what's what's your favorite one my favorite is the third one, and it seems to be also, the yeah, it seems to be the most common. Whenever yeah. I ask people what it is, and to me, oh, it's, really? yeah, to me, it's mainly because of the director. Uh, the director is okay. Alphonse Cuarón. Um, have you ever seen mm. the movie Children of Men? Heard of that? Oh, I've heard about it. I can't download it on Netflix. <laughs> okay, that's a movie you need to see, especially yes, about. I agree. Okay, you know what it's about. I've heard. I've okay. heard. Yeah, it's okay. about society without women because of like a dystopian vibe, right? Where yeah, it's only men. no children. Yeah. No, it's, oh, people oh, can't no have no like children, children in that sense. Okay. Yeah. And that's you. pretty much what it is. Got yeah. Messed up and so, like, else. he directed that. And the direction to me of it 
it made it more mature. Like I understand the problems that people say with the first two is they're literally kids movies and they're directed by mm -hmm. Christopher Columbus, who, you know, is very all over the place as far as directorial preferences. But yeah, that to me is where it kind of, it took it to another level. But from that point on, I suppose the goblet, that's right. At the end of goblets, when Voldemort comes from that the point goblet, on, yeah. after the mm -hmm. fourth one, the fourth one just, it gets so dark. Kind yeah. of liter literally and figuratively, like the movies actually get like darker in there. And oh, then by the oh, end, yeah. by the end, like the last two is just, everything's bad. And it's just a struggle and people start dying. Yeah. And I'm like, this is just sad. I don't. And then exactly. like, I'm, I give them credit or I give her credit that it had a good ending in this fact that the bad people lost and the good people won. But mm -hmm. it wasn't like a Star Wars ending where it's just this triumphant thing where, oh, everything's great and everybody goes on. And it's like, no, mm -hmm. like he is ruined. Like Harry yeah. is tr like this trauma. And then everyone who went through <laughs> oh, that, yeah. it's not like where you're going to be like, oh, we're just, oh, good. You know, hey, remember when we beat that all, you know, powerful wizard? No, it's going to be, be, we are yeah. messed up from this mm -hmm. point on. And to me, that was always... Yeah, I like it, but I'm like, I don't want to revisit that. Let me go revisit the first exactly. one. Exactly. Playing Quidditch, having fun. and Yeah. There's some sort of nostalgia in the, the first to fourth movie that's still there. It brings back a lot of childhood memories, I think, especially with me. I grew up with Harry Potter, so our ages were very similar in the movies, which was quite cool. But yeah, after that, it, it just becomes war, all out war. And like you say, too many people die. And uh, I believe uh, J.K. Rowling at some point said that she had to kill Harry because it became this thing in her head and it took over her entire being and she had to get rid of him. So I can probably spoil the movie now. I think everybody's seen it. But yeah, it's been like 10 years since <laughs> the movie came out. So yeah, yeah, so she did kill Harry and brought him back and apparently that solved it, I guess. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly interesting. I don't know where, where one would have gone, to be honest, after that, if you didn't bring blood and gore into it what would have been the next step after Harry graduated, right? Um, you do have um, The Crimes of Grindelwald now coming out and Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, which is very childlike again. It brings back the great world of, um, you know, the wizarding world, all what the you, good What things. do you think of those movies? Um, interesting, interesting. A lot of people like Harry Potter for Harry Potter and the wizarding world is a mere extra, whereas other people like the wizarding world I don't know. Uh, the latest one I very much disliked. I don't know. It just didn't bring any of the magic back. It, it was just p political in all honesty. Uh, Grindelwald represents um, sort of Nazi-ish -ish type yeah, of I person. Yeah, kind of, I didn't watch the second one either. I did not like the first one at all. Like, yeah, it, you and wouldn't again, like the I'm second not, one. Yeah, and, and you know, it's not the biggest thing like the Harry Potter thing, but like my fiance, again, mm -hmm. Lindsay, she liked it. But yeah. I did not like it. And she actually told me, cause she watched the second one and I'm like, should I watch it? And she was like, no, no, don't. <laughs> and I actually had her cause I had heard that it was something about how Grindelwald was tied with the Nazis and like, mm. cause I know that was a big thing was, Hey wizards, why are you sitting out world war two? Why are you sitting out all this stuff? And I think yeah. they tried to explain that. Right. It's, it's like, we should stop being in hiding um we should go out in the open and we should also change the way we do things and it i don't know it's very much tongue-in-cheek there, there were too many metaphors i just like it it wasn't about harry potter anymore it was very clear there were there were was more to it behind the scenes you know so it took away the it took away the magic in my opinion it took it too close to our worlds and you know it it just got depressing. They had to split up a lot of the wizards uh, based on their opinions about this political thing, which is Grindelwald's theory that we shouldn't be in hiding and we should have our own laws and we should be able to marry muggles. It's, yeah, it's, I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't my cup of tea, at least. So it seemed I think like they a, try too hard. Yeah, there you go. I was about to say, like a very forced metaphor oh, yes. of what it was trying to be. And like you said there, if you're going to make something to me that's fantasy and what I love about fantasy and what I write, um, everything I write is like medieval fantasy because I love medieval yeah. history. And what I like about <laughs> fantasy is I can create my own world. And if I want to mm. hit on something, if I want to hit on a theme or something in real life, I can do that in its own thing, but not make mm. it exactly the same. And yeah. like 
don't do i don't think someone should do that with like the nazis and the holocaust like let yeah. that be on its own that's something that really happened mm. people are still alive that went through it yeah. um maybe if you want to tie real world stuff to your fantasy maybe not pick the most you know well-known <laughs> cataclysmic event yeah. of recent memory and so that's i kind of had her explain that to me because i wanted to see her try to do it and then eventually she was like i i don't know and so yeah i just bailed and i was like yeah i don't I don't mm. think I need uh, to see that. No, uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't that great. I, I think overall as a movie, it wasn't great. Even if you did like the metaphors, it, it just wasn't that great. Yeah, I think like, they should have stopped with the first one, perhaps. It seems like it just didn't get <sighs> pulled off in that sense. But I guess, um, I don't know, A for effort in that sense. So, okay, mm, uh, <laughs> we've talked a long time. I really appreciate it. Uh, again, this is the first episode. I, th I think it went well. I, I, just, I, there, I, see this, I see it still recording. I hope it records and everyone gets to hear this. <laughs> so uh, before oh, we man. go, tell us where we can find you. And I'll put all the links and everything, you know, in the show notes More and all that. Fine. But uh, yeah, let us know. All right. So if people don't know me from Twitch, I go by Tia BC. That's T-H-E-A BC. Uh, I stream almost every second day, mostly Gwent. I now do YouTube too. So that's interesting. Also Tia BC. And on Twitter, you can find me at Tia Boysom, my real name. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but on the dangerous side there. But hey, uh, thanks so much for having me. This has been really fun. I don't often get to talk to people about serious topics. Sorry if I didn't hold back. That's basically because of my lack of interaction in that regard, especially with COVID now. I don't get to go to class and discuss these things anymore. Uh, but it's good having a discussion with an open-minded person like yourself. And I think this has been a very very uh, productive uh, podcast session. No, I think so too. And yeah, anything comes up, you know, like I said, this isn't anything too rigid or regimented. And so, no, I mean, if mm. you're game, I definitely love uh, to have you back in the future. Oh, definitely. I'm okay. game anytime. So last thing I want to do with is uh, leave us with some words of wisdom or some form of communication like if someone said it to me i'd be like you know wear a damn mask or something in that sense and it can be <laughs> your favorite quote it can be just in general but to the listeners that have stuck this through uh leave us with some final words hmm it's a difficult one what could i possibly say hmm. I'd, I'd like <laughs> i'd like to go deep again and say that the purpose of life is not to be happy it's about making a difference somewhere in the world in perhaps then you'll have happiness as a consequence. Like, hey, you're doing your best. You're not failing. And uh, yeah, you're doing good. Hold on, hold on there. Yeah, I do believe it gets better. And there wear you your mask, damn it. 